So this is the first of three papers we have in the uh, morning research paper section. And uh, with that, we'll turn it over to Anthony to present. So oh, hello. Hopefully you can see me as well. Yes. <laughs> good. Thank you. Looking good. So hello, my name is Anthony Hazapis. I'm a research associate in Fourth Greece. And uh, today we'll present uh, H3, which is an application level uh, low overhead object store. It's what we call an embedded object store. So, okay. So, object stores are uh, the most popular type of uh, cloud based storage as a service. Uh, they have become extremely popular as they offer applications unlimited capacity with no management requirements. Also, their simple data organization scheme allows practically infinite scaling. Now, applications typically use some kind of library to access the service, like here, which also hides the detail of each cloud provider's specific protocol. Amazon's Simple Storage Service, or S3, is by far the most well-known offering, and actually the S3 protocol is, is used by many other cloud providers for their respective services. Other implementations include uh, um, Microsoft's Azure Blob Storage, Google Cloud Storage, DigitalOcean Spaces, Wasabi, etc. The latter two use the S3 protocol, as a matter of fact. But what happens when you have such applications and you want to run them locally? Uh, how do you provide a similar, let's say, service on-premise? So this brings us to the motivation, to our motivation to build H3. There are solutions to deploy an object store locally, but in a, in a let's say, in a demanding environment, as an HPC environment, we'd like to, to avoid uh, using the HTTP layer for communication, which includes large protocol and data serialization overheads. Moreover, uh, we consider the, inter the interoperability of such applications with other applications that use different storage abstractions like files. This requirement in particular has been raised through our participation in a Horizon 2020 European project called Evolve that aims to build a consolidated platform for high performance data analytics applications uh, running on HPC hardware. So, to handle the needs of processing uh, extreme scale data that uh, combine steps of, uh, of com that are based on big workflows that combine steps using HPC uh, applications and big data frameworks uh, in conjunction. So early on, we decided that our best approach in Evolve was to use uh, Kubernetes as the execution environment and containerize both HPC applications and big data frameworks. Kubernetes allows us to abstract the hardware resources, which uh, then allows us to replace and scale the hardware independently of the software stack. So applications running in Evolve are written as complex graphs that uh, run some containerized code as part of each graph node. Here I show one of these graphs. And these workflows are created, configured, and triggered from notebooks that also set the stage for execution, collect results, and present visualizations. The, the, the key point here is that uh, one, each of these applications may run a combination of different frameworks and microservices like Spark, Dask, TensorFlow, Kafka, and MPI, among others. So containerization does solve the issue of gluing together different diverse stages of computation, but what about storage? It turns out that every different storage stack has different and sometimes conflicting assumptions about how data should be stored and accessed. So typically HPC applications require the presence of a shared file system. On the other hand, Big data frameworks, which are mostly tailored for the cloud, may use object stores like Amazon's S3. So we have rethought 
the concept of the object store in a in an HPC setting and present this this approach, where the object store is embedded in the application, backed by a high performance key value store. You can think of H3 as a translation layer for key value operations. Actually, inside H3, we support various uh, various key value engines with plugins, uh, as well as a local file system. And uh, in all in uh, in all cases, we'll practically move the object store service close to the application and let the the storage backend handle the network. And uh, in that case, the key value API is generally simpler and faster. And specific key value implementations may also use like high speed networks uh, or RDMA for transferring data. This figure shows the internal structure of H3 and its various components. The core of H3 is a C library called H3lib but we also provide Python and Java bindings. On the back end, H3 supports several key value stores like Redis, RocksDB, and Creon. Creon is our in-house developed key value store. Um, while on the front end, we support several interfaces for compatibility with existing software that cannot be changed. H3 Fuse implements a file system while S3 proxy provides an S3 compatible service. And this, this layer assures the, the interoperability of the different stages I, I talked about before. Uh, we also have a, an H3 CSI plugin, which uses Fuse. And uh, this, is, this is necessary to mount H3 volumes inside containers transparently. Of course, the, the, the whole ecosystem includes other tools like a command line utility for performing data operations and a benchmarking utility. So this is an example, a simple example of how H3 objects are translated into key values in the backend. The user, uh, the user uh, in the, the application, we use these two commands that result in these key values in, uh, in the back end. The previous example uh, showed the, the C API, but uh, here we show the Python and the CLI tool similar, uh, doing similar things. So for integration with Kubernetes and uh, Docker, but we mostly care about Kubernetes, we implement a standardized CSI plugin uh, where both the controller and the node plugin are integrated into one binary and packaged up into one container. So uh, CSI stands for Container Storage Interface and it's a standard, let's say, protocol for managing volumes in Docker and Kubernetes. I have some slides now showing how this works. So uh, in, a, in a Kubernetes environment. So let's assume that the user deploys some service like an Nginx server uh, with data stored in an H3 bucket. So the H3 details are defined in a persistent volume, which is attached to the pod through a respective claim. So Kubernetes assumes, uh, let's assume that Kubernetes decides to run the pod here at the second node. It then contacts the controller to ask for a mount point for this, uh, for this uh, to serve, to create this volume that's necessary. The controller contacts the node plugin at the same host and, uh, and uh, asks it to handle the mount. And then this will, this will create an H3 bucket using the backend and use Fuse to mount it. And here that because we use the Redis protocol, the key value backend may run in a different, uh, different node. So a new volume is created and 
actually fuses is uh, runs inside the node plugin container, but the mount point is propagated to the host so it can be shared with the nginx container. And then finally, the container can start with the volume provided by the node plugin. So this looks like a, a, a complicated process, but it's really simple once you break it down to the individual steps. And uh, note that the same Redis endpoint can also be used by another pod, either through Fuse or even directly via H3Lib. Now on to some uh, evaluation. Uh, to evaluate the performance of H3, we perform the series of runs comparing it to Minio, which is a, a very popular standalone S3 server. So here are the results for put and get operations in one node. And uh, for uh, in H3, we use the RocksDB and Crayon key value stores and do a series of puts and gets with various sizes with one or multiple threads. Because, because in H3 we use, uh, we use RocksDB or Crayon, this actually means that uh, in both cases, the object store and the key value store are actually embedded in the application. These are all libraries. So in contrast with Minio, there are no network round trips and no protocol overheads at all. So the result as expected is much higher throughput and lower latency, for, especially for objects at smaller sizes. For, uh, for one, the, the difference is, is uh, larger at one kilobyte, and then it, uh, at some point, the, 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 the IOs are, uh, the IO, let's say, takes up all the time, so the protocol is not very important. So this this uh, this uh, evaluation is uh, when we run H3 with Redis, where there is actually a network round trip, uh, even at the local host, which is the same with Minio. But there are no, let's say, uh, uh, serialization overheads. The the actual round trip uh, the, the round trip sorry is the same. Uh, the performance again of H3 is a bit better. But the, this needs some more uh, work. It's, a, it's an early evaluation, let's say. Now, for a, we then extend the evaluation to four nodes and use a distributed version of Crayon. We have in the lab that uses RDMA for uh, creating uh, replicas, for transferring data and creating uh, replicas among the nodes. Actually, we use a replication here and keep two replicas of each key value pair to make the deployment closer to Minio, which automatically provides data protections against failures with, when it's used with four servers. H3, again, as expected, performs a bit better, especially for reads. Note that these runs are made with much larger object sizes. So, um, about ongoing and future work. H3 is part of what we call the unified storage layer for Kubernetes, which was presented earlier uh, in April in the Keops workshop of Eurosys. Uh, with, with the, the USL is a, is, a store, is a software stack for Kubernetes that enables developers to separate workflow programming from configuration of storage attachments. And uh, this enhances uh, portability and uh, ease of use. The USL uh, includes a, a user-friendly front end to configure the storage attachments, a controller that introduces the dataset abstraction and handles the datasets, and H3, among other backends, uh, H3 is used as the high-performance backend, let's say. In addition, we are uh, working in incorporating other features uh, to, to H3, including extended attributes, support for more key value backends, and, uh, and, other, and other plugins for popular programming frameworks like Spark and TensorFlow.
So this concludes the presentation. Uh, H3 and all its components are open source and available in, on GitHub. Here are some relevant links. We also provide Docker images publicly. Uh, for more information on the Evolve project, you can visit evolve-h2020u. Thank you very much. One second. All right. Thank you, Anthony. That was very interesting. The uh, uh, Let's see if we have any uh, general questions here. So we have one from Julian. So it says, uh, Roxy B Crayon is an embedded into applications. How about parallel multi-node applications? Well, uh, in that case, uh, for, for, for going multi-node, you would need some kind of, um, let's say, backend that supports, that uses a network. So you can, uh, so, for example, with Redis or with uh, with a distributed, let's say, version of Crayon, which uses a network, uh, we can we can have various H three um, H three applications running on different nodes, and they all use the same key value store. Actually, it's like it's like a, from the key value store perspective, they are users of the key value store. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, right. the distributed version of Crayon is not yet published. Uh, I mean, it's not it's not uh, available, let's say, at GitHub, but it will be at some point. Okay. All right, let's see if another question pops up here. And in the meantime, I'll ask one. Uh, it looks like you have the ability to hook in multiple different kinds of databases. Um, one that I've had some experience with in the past that kind of fits into this category a little bit that you didn't have here was Berkeley DB. Um, had you looked at that? And if you had, what was your decision for not supporting it? <laughs> well, we, we we haven't made that decision yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, well, it's, uh, it, yeah, it just wasn't it's, a first it's, round it's, choice. Yeah, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, we, we have uh, in our lab, in fourth, we have uh, experience with uh, Rocks to Bees and, uh, mm -hmm. and Redis. So that, that were the first okay. picks, right? But okay. uh, we are thinking, uh, of course, uh, supporting more DBs like, uh, like Berkeley DB, you said, like Memcached, which is very interesting. And in some cases, so we are using, we are using H3. Uh, a nice use case is to, you know, in, uh, in between workflow steps, you want to store intermediate data and uh, mm -hmm. you want this to be very fast. So in that case, using a, a memory only database is, uh, is fine, right? Because right. the data is just transient and it will be used by the next step and then thrown away maybe. Right. So in that case, uh, even a memory only database would be fine. Okay. Um, so with going for something else like Spark, um, what about being able to support something like HDFS? Is that something that would be possible? Uh, yes, so we've tried. Uh, there, there has been some work, and I, I'm not sure if it's in the HDFS, let's say, uh, layer. We, we've gone the. I think we've gone the other way around. So with some, some plugins in Hadoop, I think. I, I'm not very familiar with the uh, with that ecosystem, but uh, we had a student working on uh, creating some plugins in uh, in the in uh, Hadoop that would allow the applications to transparently change the URL that they use and use some H3 endpoint, for example, for storing data. Now, for interfacing with HDFS, I'm not really sure how we would do that, but uh, so I can't comment. But uh, the, okay. the, the, we, we, we think that, OK, because people mainly use higher level frameworks, like Spark, as right. I said, like TensorFlow. Uh, we need to, you know, go into those frameworks and and glue our part into them into their some somehow like a, an extension to a standard library or something. Right. Yeah, that's what I was wondering about with HDFS is that if you could have an HDFS interface, um, yeah, then you could just directly support Hadoop, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
So I have two, two questions actually, um, if I may ask. Um, so firstly, regarding the workflows, I'm, I think you mentioned also before that there is some kind of integration plan and that this is part of a bigger strategy. And I, I just would be curious, what are your plans? Well, uh, regarding the workflows, so there is this, uh, this framework we use called Argo workflows. Maybe you're familiar with it. So this is pretty standard Kubernetes stuff. You, you use Argo for containerized workflows. And uh, Argo has this notion of uh, artifacts where you can use some plugin to store artifacts, uh, meaning take files uh, that when, when a step is done, it automatically takes the files and stores them somewhere. So the next step can, can use the, the artifacts from previous steps. So we have a version of Argo that uses H3 as a plugin but uh, we also use uh, Argo with volume mounts. And uh, we found out that mounting the, the, the mounting H3 as a volume through the CSI plugin I've shown is some, some way easier and more straightforward for the user because uh, the, the artifact is not created and then copied, it's directly created inside H3. There is an overhead with Fuse, of course, but this is mostly, it's easier and more uh, indirect, you know, it's, it's not stored and then copied, it's just created where it should be. Julian, I don't know if that answers your question. No, really interesting. I, I like that. Um, so I, I have one, one last question. So since H3, um, it's a different kind of API. I wonder why you have not just decided, for example, to use S3 as a standard API and just re-implement this, let's say, without HTTP. Well, the uh, okay, that's a good question. So the S, that's what that was our original plan. So that's how we started. But it turned out that a uh, there were many issues along the way. So S3 is very tied to HTTP, uh, you know, the, the, the HTTP semantics. So, for example, you pass parameters inside the headers and things like that. So you can't really un unbind, let's say, a S3 from HTTP. It's, it's a REST API. Everything is HTTP based. Um, and really, the it's so, as a protocol, it's so, you know, there are so many extensions and differentiations and uh, it's, it's kind of bloated, right? So it would be a huge effort to do that. Instead, we decided let's make a simpler, smaller protocol. And then if we want to support the full S3, let's say, uh, feature set, we can put uh, this proxy on top that uh, does the translation. Yeah, that makes absolutely sense. Actually, just we, because today in the afternoon, we have a talk about one PhD student of mine where we actually re-implemented part of S3, but in just a client library. So basically, like you have embedded, we, we just basically link against our library instead of the S3 library that does a remote HTTP. But ah, I, Okay, I, so so you, 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 let's say you over, you, you use the semantics of some client library of H3, of S3. Exactly, yes, yeah. absolutely, yes, for client library, you're right. Yeah, in that sense, I fully agree with your statement that it's a bloated API and a simpler and a smaller protocol would be useful. Um, I'm just really sort of afraid of the future of, of, of the, all this, right? Because, um, Right, S3 is so standard, I would say, while you are right, it's not standard in that sense, but everyone is using S3. In that sense, yes. you have this a good, good roadmap by using the S3 proxy, but the question is still, you know, will, will that be the future? And that, of course, may depend on the performance and other things. But yeah, I, I'm very happy to look into H3 more. Yeah, so, so I think I, I, I agree. So... Uh, my my understanding as well is that you know if you have something very custom people are not going to use it right so the the key here is how many 
uh, how many user-friendly interfaces you support, like Jay said, inside the Java or inside TensorFlow. So you have to hide the details, right? Right. Yeah, the question is lose. We, then maybe we lose again the performance benefit potential that we may have yeah. with our related API. So it's, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's really a trade great work, really great work. We have any other questions? All right, so I, I'll ask one last one here. Um, you mentioned a bit about trying to add in the Spark and TensorFlow. Um, in terms of the, and we talked a little bit about additional database backends. So architecturally, how do you see this uh, evolving? Uh, over the, the near term? Well, or is it just adding extensions at this point? Yeah, so the the, the, the architecture, let's say the layout and the, this, yeah. you know, figure is pretty much, uh, we're, we're happy with it, right? It's, okay. it's, it's gone through many iterations and it's pretty much, uh, uh, now we are thinking of, uh, you know, extending it most most importantly to the application side, so the applications can can you know not know about all these details, and uh, of course there will be you know as as we have more uh, more use cases, we will have to rework the internals as well, and, you know, make performance optimizations and things like that, support more backends and etc. But I think the most important part here is to grow inside the application ecosystem. Right, okay. Uh, Glenn's in the process of typing. As soon as that gets done here, let's see. Um, as a comment, the ambitions of H3 sim similar to uh, Saroja uh, from uh, the Cray Users Group 2017, uh, which was never published or open sourced. So uh, you may want to take a look at that and see what they've done. You put a link in the chat there if you'd like. Okay. Great. There was also a very interesting paper this year in Chaos, mm -hmm. uh, which I, I will add in the paper. So as a related work, I, I, will, uh, I will look at this as well. Thank you, Glenn. So their idea was, again, that we want to use object stores in an HPC setting. And uh, it was a group from Germany. I don't remember the details. Now, the, the idea was that they, they, they wanted to move all the, the data processing of the user space, right? So they right. wanted to say the application is, is, uh, is working in the user space and it will access an object stores th through some library which will access the disk, everything in user space. And they, for that, they kind of extracted the blue store lib, which is part mm -hmm. of Ceph, and yeah. the and their and their you know they wanted to use that standalone, right? Let's say as an object store for an application and all the data path is in user space. And it was they said it was a huge process because it's very tied with the rest of the Ceph ecosystem, and it was not yeah. easy you know to to make it into a standalone library. But I think in that sense. Uh, the 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 goals are pretty much the same in all of these projects. And that sort of is what kind of really worries me here, right? So that you have this zoo of key value stores, right? right? Or APIs, and and uh, somehow we should converge a little bit more to provide stability instead of just saying like like exactly the problem you raised, right? So you wanted to build a simpler and smaller protocol because it was bloated in S3. And the question is, if we extend whatever you have, right, in the long term, maybe it becomes bloated too, and then there will come the next group, right? So I, I really worried in that sense for the community, right, for this long-term support. Yeah, that, that's the way it goes, right? We have to do many iterations. I think there's a saying that says protocols are good. That's why we have so many. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Very yeah. Good. Very good. Yeah. So thank you. All if right. you have any more questions, thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Anthony.